Good evening. This is Rise Up Cooperative, and it is our adults virtual session. And tonight we have Nicole Benjamin with Legal Aid on to share with us about Legal Aid and what they do within the community. And she's got some great information to share with us tonight. Thank you so much for being on with us tonight, Nicole. All right, no problem. So um, I'll introduce myself as well. Um, so my name is Nicole Benjamin. I am a staff attorney with Legal Aid of East Tennessee. I've been practicing with legal services um, for my whole career, honestly. So it's been um, about a little over nine and a half years now um, that I've been doing this work. Um, and even in law school, I was doing help with indigent work, working at our child and family litigation clinic. So this really has um, a big piece of my heart and passion. So I really enjoy working with Legal Aid. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Legal Aid. So we're Legal Aid of East Tennessee. We're a nonprofit 501c3 entity. Uh, what we do is provide civil legal aid services to individuals who meet certain criteria, depending on what grants we have. Um, so we have, oh, let me let me back up a little bit. So we've got the civil legal aid. So things that we don't help with, we don't help with criminal matters at all. Uh, we don't help with things that are income driven. So like if you have a personal injury case and you're like seeking a bunch of money from like some injury or car wreck or something, we don't do those. Um, what we do focus on is we have certain priorities that we have to look at before we take a case. And so our main priorities are cases affecting the safety and well-being of children. Um, recently, we've added as high priorities, um, grandparent adoptions, guardianships, public benefits help, family evictions, orders of protection, protecting children, and other cases that promote stability and help kids. One reason that we've um, focused a more of a high priority on these certain things is because of the opiate um, crisis that's going on, especially in East Tennessee. We see that affecting a lot of families, especially, and with parents becoming addicted to opiates, having children in danger. So we see those grandparents stepping in. So we're trying to help them. And that way we can keep the children safe. Some other um, areas that we help with is housing. So with our housing um, grants, we help people with eviction matters, foreclosures, um, habitability issues. So let's say there's like mold, like black mold in your house, or you have like holes in your floor and your landlord's not fixing them. So issues like that. Um, prevention of homelessness, um, unfair treatment in public and Section 8 housing, um, as well as housing discrimination. And I'll go a little bit more into that um, later because that's one of the specialties that I, I focus um, some of my time in. Um, we also help with healthcare issues. So if there are issues um, dealing with Medicare, mental health services, health insurance, Medicaid, um, including TenCare issues, and other um, cases that involve access to healthcare, we help with those. Usually it, it comes with like denial of those benefits or denial of um, maybe prescription medications that you're needing, your doctor is saying you need, and you have to appeal um, through those bureaucratic um, ladders really um, to like try to get um, help with getting the certain medications that you need. Um, we also help with income maintenance and preservation. So that can include employment law issues, unemployment benefits, uh, wage claims, um, supplemental security income issues, families first issues, as well as veterans benefits. Um, we also help with consumer protection issues. Um, that can include bankruptcies, collection defenses, garnishments, utility maintenance, um, driver's license reinstatements, uh, fraudulent lending, identity theft, predatory lending, and like rent-to-own issues. <clears throat> And then we come to one of my other specialties, which is family support. Um, so we help victims of domestic violence, elder abuse or neglect. We help in obtaining orders of protection, um, assisting victims of human trafficking. Uh, we help in some divorce cases where it's helping protect a spouse or a child, um, custody, visitation, um, issues when it's necessary to protect children. 
Uh, we help with violence and neglect issues involving children. That can be um, where someone files what's called a dependency and neglect action over in juvenile court. We help with that or um, just divorces in general or people that are unmarried. They just have custody issues. So we help with those. Um, and then sometimes we'll help with child support issues. Um, usually we don't help in just straight child support issues. It'll usually be like a collateral um, issue that's in their order of protection or in their divorce, then we have to do it because you have to do all those together. But we don't normally just take on child support cases by themselves because the state of Tennessee actually has a division that helps with child support enforcement and obtaining child support. Um, another area that we help with are populations with special vulnerabilities. And so that includes, again, children, elderly people, people that are uneducated, mentally ill people, people with certain disabilities, well, not just certain disabilities, but disabilities um, and special education needs. And we also include with that non-English speaking people or people from different cultural, cultural or religious backgrounds. Um, we do this and we have these priorities because these groups of people have a particular um, like difficulty accessing and utilizing the justice system. And they may come from somewhere and they just don't even know how our justice system works. So we, we really want to help those people. And so issues that come up with these a lot of times with the vulnerable populations are issues with nursing homes, um, conservatorships, powers of attorney, and advanced directives, especially for like the elderly people. So that way people know kind of what their wishes are when they come to like end of life care or in the hospital for some reason. Um, so we are legal aid of East Tennessee. So we are the entire Eastern block of Tennessee. Tennessee is separated into three grand divisions. So we have East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and West Tennessee. Um, there are legal aids all over the entire state that um, a lot of them do some of the same work that we do, but we're just here in East Tennessee and we cover 26 counties. It's a lot. <laughs> so we have offices here in Chattanooga. Um, we have two offices. We have our downtown office, which is on um, Martin Luther King Boulevard, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, I think. Um, and then we also are located at the Chattanooga Hamilton County Family Justice Center, which is where I'm located. Um, I've been there, I think, since mainly housed there since 2017. Uh, we also have an office in Cleveland, Knoxville, Maryville, uh, the Knoxville Family Justice Center, Morristown. I think it's Bluntville Family Justice Center. I always get that word mixed up. <laughs> I think it's Bluntville. Um, Johnson City and also the Family Justice Center that's in Johnson City. So we're all over, like from here basically to Mountain City is how we um, kind of describe it. Uh, and then here locally, just in like our Chattanooga area, which we call our Southern region, um, we represent people in three different judicial districts, um, which are the 10th, 11th, and 12th. So the counties in the 10th judicial district are Bradley County, McMinn County, Monroe, Polk, um, and then we also represent um, people in Meigs County, which is technically in the ninth judicial district. So I'm not really sure why we have that one, but we do. Um, and then we have the 11th, which is just Hamilton County. So I practice a lot in Hamilton County. Um, that's really my main, main county. And then we also help in the 12th judicial district, which is Bledsoe, Marion, Ray, and Sequatchie. So there's a lot of people in those counties that we uh, try to help, but there's three um, attorneys located at our Family Justice Center that mostly, uh, well, there's me and then there's John Jolly. We represent people mostly in the 11th, which is Hamilton, and then the 12th, which is like Bledsoe, Marion, Ray, and Sequatchie. So it's just two of us in those main counties dealing with domestic issues. And then our Cleveland office, plus another attorney that's in our office, Jason, he um, helps people with domestic issues in the 10th judicial district, including like Bradley and all those outer counties. And he also does like evic eviction prevention. And then a little bit more background. So I mentioned earlier that we have grants that we run on and work under, and there are several big ones that we have. So our largest one is federally funded through Congress, which is the Legal Services Corporation. And that is what funds 50% of our entire funding. Um, 
they have to, I think, renew it like every couple years or so. I'm not exactly sure on the time period, but that's the main um, funding source. With that, we have a lot of regulations that we have to follow. Um, so that, that's just the main one. Uh, we also have funding under the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Office of Criminal Justice Programs, United Way funds, I think, 7% of our entire funding. Uh, we have some state grants that we have. Um, there's some fundraising and contributions that we receive and some federal funding that we get. More specifically, we do have a large grant that we received dealing with eviction prevention because of COVID and the after effects of that and people losing their jobs. There are a lot of people facing evictions and that's become a crisis in our area. So we do have a large um, grant that helps with those issues. So we've got um, Ben Danford in our downtown office and Ann Boatner who focus, I, I think all of their time really on just doing eviction prevention. And also Jason, I mentioned earlier, he also does some of that. Um, then we have our uh, vial, what is it? our BOCA grant. So it's, I think, Victims of, yeah, Victims of Crime Act. And so I'm funded under that one. And so with that grant, we help people that are victims of domestic assault, stalking, sexual assault, or human trafficking issues. Um, and so that can be like any legal problem that they have with those. Most of the time, we're really helping with order protections and other domestic cases, but we've helped with some consumer issues um, and contract disputes um, with people that are um, having domestic violence situations and also like evictions. Um, we've had some people trying to be kicked out of their homes because the police have been called to their apartment too many times. So the landlords um, try to kick them out. <laughs> um, and then we also have a Title III grant, which one of our attorneys downtown works under. And so this grant helps with pretty much any legal issue that someone has and they're over 60 years old. So um, with that grant, it doesn't matter what income you have. Um, you can honestly be a millionaire and get our services under that one um, <laughs> because there's no limit on, on the income requirements. VOCA also is that same way. There's no income requirements uh, related to that because a lot of times like it, the abuser kind of restricts their access to getting funds um, or kicks them out of their house or some other issue and they don't have access to those funds. So there's no limit on those. And then we actually, the entire state um, and all of the legal aids recently received a very large grant to help with what we call family-centered legal services. And so that's through the Department of Human Services in Tennessee. And so we partnered with, um, it's the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. So they are kind of like an umbrella group that helps um, with, because we, we can't, um, lobby on anything, but they are lobbyers for like civil legal aid issues and they help update us on different legislative initiatives that are going on that affect kind of like what our work is. And so they update us, but they're, they're kind of like a, I don't know, like an umbrella group for all of us. And we're actually going to all of, all of us in the estate are going to a training next week in Murfreesboro. So we'll be we do that every year. And so we get all of our CLE credits and everything through them. It's, it's great. Get to network with all of the other legal aid people throughout the state. And so that way um, we just kind of come together and form task force. So I'm like very active on our family law um, task force through Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. And so we have meetings and kind of go over issues that we're seeing across the state and just brainstorming with each other to make sure that we are all kind of on the same page and maybe how we can attack certain problems. So it's really awesome. I really like them. Um, but yeah, they, they are the ones that kind of like received the grant and then they parceled it out as I guess we're subcontractors for um, all of the different offices in the state. So that's really cool. That one though is a very um, kind of limited grant. So with that one, we can help with pretty much any legal issue that someone's having, but they have to meet, well, first they're the adult. Um, they have to be a citizen of the United States. Uh, oh, that's one thing with our VOCA grant too, you do not have to be a citizen um, to receive help for that one. But with this new grant, you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to have a child in the home that is under 18 years of age. Um, 
and we do require a lot of documentation on the front end to get that before we can start helping. And they can also, if they, if they're maybe over income, then we can qualify them if they receive certain benefits. So if they're receiving like free and reduced lunch or eligible to receive free and reduced lunch, then we can help them or if they have 10 or if they receive 10 care or um, what else? food stamps um, and programs like that, then we can help people with any of their legal problems. But that's a very new one. We're still learning it. We're, like, we're going up to our training next week a day early, people on this grant, so we can learn more about it because it's it's very complicated, just the front end of the stuff. But I'm excited about it. It's helping children, people with um, children. So that's kind of my passion. I really enjoy that. Um, so over this last year, um, Legal Aid has, I think we've helped over 11,500 clients and family members throughout our 26 counties. And so we're really proud of that. Um, we also have created an economic impact of over $70 million for East Tennessee, which is great. Um, we do also, we're, so as I was saying earlier, we don't really have, um, a whole lot of people that are able to cover all of our counties and the people that we can service. So really we are able in our service area, there are 400,000 eligible people that we could serve. We just don't have the main power to do it. Um, we don't have all the money to do it. So we do have what's called a pro bono project, which is pretty awesome. We have pro bono directors in each of our three main offices. So Johnson City, Knoxville, and Chattanooga. And so what these group of people do is they kind of um, elicit help from the private bar and get them to work on some cases as pro bono hours. So they're not charging people for their legal help, but they are taking on cases that we just don't have the manpower to do. So they do a lot of adoptions, um, consumer work. They've helped with some evictions. They help with clinics that we have. Um, that's another thing that our pro bono project ex coordinator in our area has done is um, help with a lot more clinics this year. Um, we've had we're starting our child support clinic back up. We have one recently. They've had some name change clinics um, to help people with name changes, especially members of the like transgender community that want to change their name. So we've helped with those. Um, they've had some veteran um, clinics where they were helping just veterans help with whatever legal problem they're having. Um, and I think they've done some expungements in driver's license reinstatements for people, which has been nice. Um. And then I was speaking more specifically, I was talking um, that I work under certain grants. And so one of them is fair housing. Uh, I don't get a whole lot of work from this area, unfortunately, because there's just not a lot of people that reach out. Um, but we're there and we're able to help with those issues. Uh, so with fair housing, so what, the, what that is, is we help people that are in protected classes um, not be discriminated against in just different housing issues. So whether it's like renting to them, um, lease issues, um, those types of things, that's usually what comes up. But those protected classes, they include like race, um, color, religion, national origin, sex, which includes sexual orientation and gender identification, uh, familial status, as well as people with disabilities. And with people with disabilities, that is our most sought after class, I guess. That's the really the only cases I've had since I've been working on fair housing. I think that's been about a year now. And I've had maybe a handful of them and they've all been disability related. And so a lot of them actually come up with assistive animals. So people that need emotional support animals and um, service dog issues or service animal issues, mostly dogs, but service animal issues. Um, so we help with those. And then maybe um, people asking for reasonable accommodations or modifications to their leases or even just their apartments. 
where I had this one little, little lady who really needed some help getting in the bathroom because the door wasn't wide enough for her walker to get through. Um, that was one issue that we were helping her with. Um, and then we've had more recently someone with assistive animals where she had two different dogs. And so we had to help get her the reasonable accommodations to have both of her dogs because each one helped with different things, <laughs> like different medical issues. So those come up if there's multiple service animals um, and not usually just one, usually just one's a little bit easier, but two is a little bit difficult. Uh, we had to go through a lot of processes. Um, so that's about like 10% of my time is what I do with fair housing. Um, one of our big, big issues and one of our most requested services is help with order of protection. So here in Hamilton County, we do order protection court every week, Mondays at 1.30 p.m. in circuit court. Uh, we also help in chancery court in Hamilton County. And then in the other counties that we assist in, we help in general sessions court. Those are usually the ones there. But with order protections, um, that is helpful to any domestic abuse victim, stalking victim, or sexual assault victim who has been subjected to, threatened with, or placed in fear of domestic abuse, stalking, sex, sexual exploitation of a minor, sexual assault, or human trafficking offense. And those are the people that can seek relief under um, order protection statutes. Uh, people can get the order protections in either the place where the perpetrator is residing or where the abuse took place, or if the perpetrator is not a resident of Tennessee, then the person who's a resident here can get it in the county in which they live. The duration of order of protections are a year or up to a year. The judge does not have to grant the entire year. Um, and we've seen that more recently where they'll give like six months or three months, um, but usually we get a year. That's just a a recent trend. I don't, I'm not sure why, but it is. Um, once a person files for an order of protection, and they can do that um, locally here in Hamilton County. They can go down to the Hamilton County Courthouse at 625 Georgia Avenue. There are two ladies at the clerk's office down there that actually help um, people get the paperwork and fill it out. It's free for victims to fill those out. They don't have to pay a filing fee, which is nice. The legislature um, implemented that because they don't want to have like a um, kind of freezing process on people seeking help. And so they really wanted to make sure that people understood that domestic violence is serious. And so that's why they've worked that into where they don't have to pay for it up front because that would be a, a hindrance to a lot of people to pay court fees. Um, so once a person files the order of protection, that respondent has to be served with the paperwork. Uh, they have 15 days to get a hearing during that time. So they're entitled to a hearing. So what the judge does is they'll look at the little petition that the petitioners filled out and explaining why they feel like they need an order of protection. At that time, the judge will decide whether they'll issue what's called an ex parte order of protection, which is a temporary order to limit the contact of the perpetrator with the, the domestic abuse victim. Uh, so the, they shouldn't have contact during that time while their time period is pending for them to have the hearing. Uh, so that's when the clock starts. And so once they're served, they have 15 days to be able to get a hearing. It's a very quick turnaround. Um, that's why it keeps us very busy usually is because we have court every Monday and then like every other Monday, like there's just new petitions filed and it, there's a lot. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, there's the one year that it can be granted up to one year that it can be granted. Uh, if there is any violation of that order of protection, it can be extended maybe for a good cause for another year, which is nice. Um, maybe if there's like a divorce going on or something, you can ask the judge to extend another year. If there's a violation of that order of protection, it can be extended up to five years. If there are two or more violations of the order of protection, you can get 10 years um, extension on that. Um the order protections are kind of interesting because there are certain things that you can ask the court to do when you're 
um, getting the order protection. And so with that, there's, you want to have no contact, the respondent to have no contact with you, um, no communication, direct communication, or by third parties uh, coming about you. So come to your job, your work, things like that. Um, tells you not to stalk or domestically abuse them, <laughs> but that's, I mean, you're not supposed to do that anyway, but that's what they were doing to get it in the first place. Um, one of the big things too is possession of the home. So the petitioner can ask that the court give them possession of the home. Um, so the respondent gets kicked out. So this is always a big contentious issue with that because then where do they go? Um, or what if the lease is just in that person's name and you're staying there? So that becomes an issue a lot of times, or if it's the marital home, then it becomes a divorce issue. It's a whole thing. Um, but that's a really good thing. So that way somebody can feel safe and they can be in the home alone. Uh, let's see. One other thing with order protections that's big is you can ask for custody of the kids um, in that order. Um, and when you have a hearing or even during the pendency of the hearing, you can kind of negotiate and see if we can get a visitation schedule with the kids. Um, we can ask for financial support, such as like temporary alimony, temporary child support. Um, what else? Oh, we can ask for like care and custody of animals that they own jointly. That's been an issue that we had before where somebody was like fighting over these two Great Danes. Uh, and so that was, that was interesting. But yeah, a lot of people actually don't leave the, the abusive relationship because they're scared of what the perpetrator is going to do to their animals. And usually those animals are like safe spaces for those people and they don't want them to be harmed and they know that they would harm them. Uh, let's see. It is. One new thing, it's kind of new, um, it's been on the books for like a couple of years, is cell phones. So that becomes an issue because if you have shared cell phone plans, that's something now that you can ask the court to order the cell phone provider to um, let you be responsible for your billing of your line and then take your number with you so you don't have to change your number. Um, so that's new. It's this whole separate order. Um, another big issue with order protections is the dispossession of firearms. So if an order of protection is granted, the respondent is supposed to um, sign a like attestation that they dispossess their firearms. If they have any, they, it doesn't mean they have to sell them or like throw them away or whatever they do. I don't, I'm not a firearm person. I don't know. Um, but they can like give them to someone to keep, but they have to like attest that they do not have possession of them anymore. Um, so again, with violations, um, a little bit building on what I said before, like with the extensions of them. So once an order protection, you've had a hearing, the judge grants it for a year, say there is a violation. So that violation itself will trigger a whole separate crime. So if you violate an order of protection in Tennessee, the district attorney's office can charge you with violation of an order of protection, which is a class A misdemeanor, which is punishable up to 11 months, 29 days in jail just for that separate violation. So they want to make sure that people take that seriously. Because, I mean, in all essence, it really is just a piece of paper. It's a like a piece of paper, the judge signs telling you to stay away from someone. That scares a lot of people, that threat of going to jail, but some people just don't care. And so we have to like safety plan with our clients and make sure that they have like go bags and different things like that, um, like safe places to go. Or sometimes after issuance, they, we ask that they call like the sheriff's department or Chattanooga police department and be put on a watch list. So they kind of uh, patrol that area a little bit more and they can drive by a little bit more often, which is nice. Um, another issue that we can bring up with the court with violations or contempt issues. And so we can ask that the judge that, so judges don't like their, their orders um, violated at all. So what they do is what's called contempt of court. And so with contempt of court, that judge can punish you for violations. And so we had, I think it was in our Knoxville, Knoxville office. They, um, one of our former attorneys there, I think got a contempt judgment against someone and they got like 800 and something days in jail because every text message that that person sent is a separate violation. So they had so many, I think it was like 84. Yeah. 84. Cause they can be 
um, punishable up to 10 days in jail for each violation and or a $50 fine for each one. So that person got 840 days in jail, which is like crazy. <laughs> Our judges here, unfortunately, don't sentence a lot of people to jail or they'll do like a sentence, but suspend it. So, but that guy got like 840 days and I was like, that is awesome. They like really took it serious there. It's great. Um, another recent uh, development in the order of protection world is lifetime order protections. So this is very new. We have yet to do one at our office. We have been trying to find a case where we can do an, a lifetime order protection. We're nerds and we want to try all the stuff out. And this is like our bread and butter. And so like we are really into it and we really want to find a case where we can get this lifetime order protection. Um, so with this one, the person can already have just a regular order of protection. And maybe there is a criminal case that's going on simultaneously when we have an order of protection. So they have maybe like aggravated domestic assault charges or like aggravated rape or something like that. So if they're convicted of certain felony offenses, then you can petition the court for the lifetime order of protection. And so these felony offenses kind of fall in the code under like the assault ones, like I was saying, aggravated domestic assault, um, homicide, like attempted homicide. We've got a couple of those going on right now where there people have been um, charged with attempted first degree murder or something along those lines. So I, I'm hoping we have a couple that we get lifetime ones. Um, kidnapping, false imprisonment. And this kind of comes under the human trafficking realm too. So all of those, if they're convicted of any of those that end up being a felony conviction, then we can help with it. And then um, sexual offenses. So that's another area that we help in too is um, like child sexual abuse. We have a lot of those cases and those I'm really passionate about. And I pretty much take every single one that comes into my my office. Um, let's see. That is mostly it. I did want to say... Um, maybe a little bit about our intake process and how you can actually get to a lawyer um, at our office. So at the Family Justice Center, where I'm located, we, unfortunately, we don't accept walk-ins just because we have very busy court schedules, but we have two paralegals on site. Um, when somebody walks into the Family Justice Center, they can interact with one of the Family Justice Center navigators. And so what they do is they'll ask the person kind of what they need help with, and usually they'll ask for legal aid. And so what they do is they have a little referral sheet, they'll write down all the information, give it to one of my paralegals. My paralegal will call them back, go over um, some questions regarding like their income, so that way we can see if they're eligible for services, um, and just some other data points, and then kind of like what their legal problem is, if it's something that we can help with. So once that happens, then the paralegal will hand it to either myself or John or sometimes Jason um, and see just who's wanting to take it. So as attorneys, we are able to either accept to represent a client or we can decline representation. It's very rare that we completely decline any sort of services for someone unless it's um, just out of our priorities or just not something that we do. So because we're we're limited in the just time that we have and just being in different places, um, we can't represent every single person that applies for services. So what we do is set them up for appointments to maybe just give them advice. Um, so that can be either just advice on how to kind of file for an order of protection um, or maybe talking to them about their fair housing issue a little bit, or maybe a, their eviction issue, or, um, maybe just talking about like the divorces, um, divorces are not, um, necessarily high priorities for us just because a divorce isn't something that's necessarily going to keep you safe. Um, but it is something that I do take on a lot, especially with our victims, because, there's like asset issues and keeping kids safe with custody issues. So I do take those on. Um, so that's another big area that I help in is divorce work um, and child custody work. So those are a little bit longer period cases because once 
we get the person in, do their intake, we draft their paperwork, we file their paperwork. If they don't have kids, it's at least 60 days that they have to wait to get a final hearing. And then, sorry, it's my kid screaming if you hear her. <laughs> I'm home. Okay, good. Um, and then if they have kids, it's at least 90 days before they can get a final hearing. So it's either going to be 60 days or 90 days at the least um, for them to get divorced. So sometimes it can take a while. I had one divorce that's been going on two, two years, two and a half years, just because it, there's so much like just acrimony and they're just, we can't agree on stuff. And so it's just taking forever um, to get that done. But those, we, we do take them. Um, a lot of people are wondering like why they don't get help or something. And it's, it's not that we don't want to help. It's like, we can't help. Um, but we, we are there at least for advice for people. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of us in a nutshell. Um, are there any questions from you, Sandy? I do have a few, but first okay. I want to say thank you so much. I didn't, and I'm at a soccer game. If you can hear all the noise around me, my apologies. Like, um, I, I didn't know that you guys did as much as you do. That's really awesome. Or the area that you cover is massive. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I also didn't know you guys are a nonprofit. That's pretty cool. I learned so much tonight from you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so basically, there are all kinds of people that can qualify mm -hmm. for your services. But for them to really know if they qualify, they should contact you guys, right? And you'll yes. walk through that. And regardless if you can help them legally, you'll still give them advice. Mm -hmm. So regardless, they could help. That wasn't really a question. I guess it was just kind of... And I can give um, our intake lines too. So we have our downtown office um, in Chattanooga. That intake line is 423-756-4013. And that'll get you to our downtown office directly for our family justice center where we do more of like the domestic violence work. Um, that phone number is 423-643-7604. Um, that will direct you to Jennifer Redman, who is our main intake paralegal. And she can definitely help with doing the intakes and getting the person to where they need to be. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. No um, I was taking notes while you were talking. Let me see if I had any more questions. Um, how old is legal aid? How oh, gosh. You been around? Um, <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure. I know it's been around at least 30, 40 years because wow. our, so my, bu my boss, Russell, and then our big boss, Deb House, who's in our Knoxville office, um, they have been with Legal Aid, I think, for 35 plus years. Um, so Deb House is our executive director. She's housed in Knoxville. And then Russell Fowler mm -hmm. is our director of advocacy and litigation. And he's in our Chattanooga office. Um, and so, yeah, they've been along for around for a long time. That's and so, awesome. yeah, so there, there, I know there used to be like a split between legal aids and then there was like a joining of them, I think in like the nineties maybe. And then there was like a disjoining of them at some point, because I worked for the other legal services corporation, like before I came on with Legal Aid of East Tennessee. So I worked with Southeast Tennessee Legal Services when I started out. And then in late 2016, early 2017, we merged. And so that brought on two, two paralegals and two attorneys onto Legal Aid, which were me and the other attorney, and then two of our paralegals. That's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was nice. I like the, I like the murder. It was good. That's awesome. Um, one more question, and you might have said this, and I missed it. Um, cost or fees associated with your your help, your um, it, I, I'm sure, and it might depend on what you need help with. I don't know. So it is free, completely free. So our wow, legal okay. help, yeah, our legal help is um completely free. We don't charge for attorneys' fees um at all. <laughs> um, what does kind of incur costs is the, just the cost of litigation itself. So um, even though we don't charge for attorney's fees, 
we, there are some fees that people do have to pay. So that would be like initial court filing fees um, or court costs after the case is finished, or we go to in divorce cases mediation. So they'll have to pay for the mediator's fees. Um, and then maybe if we can't get somebody served with process, we have to um, enlist like the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. It's like 40 $42, I think, maybe 46 something around in there, like mid-40s. Um, they have to pay for that. Or if we can't find them anywhere, they have to pay for like publication. So they have to pay for those fees. But as direct attorney's fees, none, as long as they qualify okay. for grants. Okay. And so that's what makes sense why you have so many grants yeah. and <laughs> funding that covers what you do in order to provide that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can't think of any. Those were all the questions that I had. You answered as you were talking several that I had typed out. I was like, oh, she answered that one. So <laughs> that's it. it. Do you have anything else you want to share that you might have thought of? Um, not really. I think I kind of went over, Um, I think what kind of is just a broad overview of kind of what we do and just specifically more like what I do. But if anybody has questions or they want someone to come and present on anything, we're always open. That's another part of what our grants are is community outreach. So we're happy to give trainings or anything because that's another thing that we do. We train um, the navigators that come in through um, the Family Justice Center. We train court advocates through partnership whenever they get different people. So we're, we're happy and open to doing any and all trainings or community outreach at all. Awesome. That's amazing. And so people would just contact you with those same numbers that you gave mm -hmm. earlier. And okay. Yep. Very cool. Well, thank you again so much for your time and all that information. I would greatly appreciate your time tonight, Nicole. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me.